the name of the message is uh, your history is not your destiny. Hallelujah. Um, or you could even say your destiny is not in your history. Right. You know, either way, it's, it's important. Um, and I, w- I want to start off by first talking about salvation. And this might seem real basic, but sometimes I think we kind of miss the basics and we're tripping over ourselves and we don't know why. So salvation happens when we accept Jesus, right, in our hearts as our Lord and Savior. How many of you have done that? All right. And so that changes us from a sinner. Our classification changes, not necessarily the act of sin, but our classification. Y'all get it when I say classification? We are no longer classified as a sinner, but we are now classified and justified as a child of God. We're classified. We're justified. We are now a child, no longer a sinner. Okay? Does that make sense to y'all? Because sometimes I think people miss this. It's like we get saved and then we start getting confused. Well, if I'm, if I'm a new creation, which you are by classification, you're a new creation. But yet we still deal with our soul. We still are like, well, but I don't feel any different. I'm a new creation, but I don't feel any different. And so then we try to start acting different when we're not really different at all because we haven't gone through the process of sanctification. Amen? And so it's very important. You, you've been delivered and set free, and you're a new classification, but we are, have not been necessarily set free from sin that has been committed against us. How many of you have been a victim of circumstance, a victim of somebody else's sin? Okay? That messes with you, does it not? I was abused, abandoned, rejected. You know, that messed with my head. It messed with my emotions. And just because I got saved one day, hallelujah, everybody say hallelujah, Hallelujah. doesn't mean that beat up child was any different. You feeling me this morning? Okay. So I want to make it real clear, just because you've been saved doesn't mean you've been liberated. Liberation comes through sanctification. And your liberation only comes by obedience to the word of God, which is the process of sanctification. So you're saved, but you're not liberated. You on point with me this morning? Okay, so the point is I, my conduct needs to come in line with my position. Okay? And so this morning, I don't really want to talk. There's been a lot of talk. People, I think, also get confused if I'm saved It's all about heaven or hell. And I really think we need to have more teachings about heaven and hell because how many of you know hell's real? Hell is real today. If you're not born again, if you're not a child of God, those people, you, if you're here today, you do not know Jesus, you're going to hell. Not to be the bearer of bad news, but I'm also the bearer of good news. Hey, I got the answer. You can go to heaven today too. If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Okay, so we get that. But then we trip up because, you know, we walk through life and we make mistakes and we sin and we have all these confused emotions because we're not yet liberated. And so then I'm, it becomes a heaven and hell issue. There's that teaching, well, if you sin, you're going to hell. No, you're not. You've just sinned. You've made a mistake. Repent for crying out loud. Get over it and go forward. Okay, so here's the thing. We, we, then, then it comes, well, God loves me. God loves me. God loves me. I can do whatever I want because no matter what I do, God loves me. Yeah, okay, you know what? You're right. No matter what you do, God's going to love you. He loved you when you were out there in the world. He loved you when you were slopping with the pigs. And he loves you now that you're saved. He's not going to love you any more or any less. God loves you. Let's get that straight, okay? It's not a heaven or hell issue. And it's not a God loves me issue. God loves you. Everybody say, God loves me. No matter what I do, God loves me. Do we have that settled today? Thank you. The problem is we can disrupt the call of God on our life by the things we do or the things we don't do. You all have a call. I look around this house, and I am amazed at the potential of each and every one of you. In fact, I think I see things in you that you do not see in yourselves. I guarantee you I see it because that's something God has done for me. 
I know the giftings you have. I know the giftings you have. I know the giftings you have. I see the potential that you have. I see the potential. Oh my gosh, you guys are just like, you blow my mind with potential. God given potential. Hallelujah. Paul encourages us. Okay, you have potential. I have potential. I still have potential. None of us have arrived, but we, we don't always reach our potential. And one of the saddest things that I see happening in the church today is you all have potential, but I don't see you living in your potential. I don't see you walking out to the point of letting these things fall off of your life like I had to have them fall off in my life. Oh, man. Well, some, <laughs> I got to share this. One, I, people have said this actually a lot to me and probably to other leaders. And, and one of the things is, man, I cannot wait until I can get behind the pulpit. I can't wait until I can have a big ministry, which this is not a big ministry, but it is the pulpit. And let me just say, nothing good, nothing powerful comes without sacrifice. You do not know the tears I have had to cry, the loneliness I have had to go through, the, the, the accusations and the lies that have been spoken about me. And the Lord says, do not, you know, you know, do not, you know, act out, you know, I'm supposed to just let him take care of things. That stuff makes you die. You do not know the death that people have to go through in order to fulfill the call. And that's the thing, our flesh doesn't want to die. We want the call, but we don't want the death that perhaps goes along with it. So let's talk about, Paul shows us he admonishes us, he encourages us to take a look at our ancestors. Take a look at the Old Testament because you can learn a lot of what to do and what not to do. So today I want to take you on a journey. Can we go on a journey today together? So if you would go to Exodus, if you have your Bibles, but this is going to be like a drive-by shooting, okay? This is going to be a drive-by through Exodus because obviously if you know Exodus it's a very big book and I don't have time today to take you all the way through Exodus so I'm gonna hit the high points and I can't even hit all of the high points for you today but we need to learn from the children of Israel because how many of you know human nature does not change you are a new creation but you still deal with your flesh all right so we're gonna start in 13 Wow, was that me breathing? Yep. <laughs> mm. I'm told to go like that. Okay. I'm a heavy breather. So the wilderness way. So just to set you up in case you do not know this story, this is where Moses, uh, through the power of the Lord, delivers the children of Israel from Egypt. Okay. And there were many plagues. Read the story, okay? I'm not going to tell you. But so finally, Pharaoh says, get the heck out of here. I don't want anything more to do with you. Take your pay people and get, okay? Paraphrased. Uh, so then it says, then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that way was near. Everybody say, shortcut. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war, everybody say war, war, and return to Egypt. So this morning, I want to just point out today through this passage, God is taking us, and Egypt, by the way, is a type and shadow of the world. We've all come out of the world. I came out of the world. You came out of the world, okay? The, Egypt is a type and shadow of the world. So God saved us, right? And let me just tell you, like the children of Israel, you're not going to go through a shortcut. How many of you have tried to go through a shortcut but then realized it didn't work? Okay, God is telling us right here, although uh, I'm taking them, not taking them through the land of the Philistines, though that way is near, for God said, thus perhaps the people change their minds. Have you ever gotten to that place after you've gotten saved? Like, oh my gosh, it was better out in the world because now I'm having to face some demons. Now I'm having to face something in my flesh and I don't like it. Oh, I want to go back, but you know what? It's too, it's too far to go back. So God says, keep going forward. In fact, even says here later in the passage, you flip the page. 
And what I love here in 21, it says, the Lord went uh, before them as a, as a cloud and, and, and a pillar of fire. And so to me, that says, you know, we, are, we get saved, but then we have his protection and direction. He gives us protection and direction if we would just go along the path. But too many times, and they squalled, and they bawled, and they complained, and they murmured, and you know, all that stuff, like we do. Everybody say, we do it. Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> and as we keep going on, then it, it comes to a place where they're at the Red Sea, and, and you know what? Just because you've left Egypt doesn't mean your enemies will not continue to pursue you. You know, the enemy does not like the fact that you have left the world. The enemy wants to call you back. He wants you to, to want him. Once I referred to him as an old boyfriend, because you know this relationship with Jesus Christ is, is, is a relationship. And he's our new lover. Well, your old lover would like to have you back for no other reason than to abuse you and confuse you. And so he's chasing you down all the time. And so then we get to this place in the, uh, I'll just start. Uh, yeah, and then, and then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? You know, there's, there's Egypt, the wilderness, and the promised land. And in order to get to the promised land, you've got to go through the wilderness. And they're saying, what? He has to take us to the, through the wilderness to kill us? And let me just say, yes. <laughs> he needs to kill your flesh. He wasn't after the children of Israel to kill them physically, like, you know, alive or dead but yeah you know there's that part of our flesh that just doesn't want to die and yeah you got to go from to get to the promised land or the blessings you got to go through the wilderness so your flesh can die hello but too many times we want to play fleshy fleshy in the church why can't we just act like the world in the church because this is the lord's house for one you are the temple of the Lord. Why in the world would you want your temple to be full of the world? Do you not want to die? I did. Hey, some of the best things that have ever happened to me was to die to myself. Amen. All right. So then it says, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. This is again where they were like, just let us go. We want to go back because it was better, because it was easier. Where, where, where? <laughs> it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than it would be to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Tell the children, God said, to go forward. God says, Do not be afraid. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Stand still. See my salvation in your life. It's not just coming out of the Egypt, but it's the salvation of your flesh. It's being renewed, okay? And then stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. And he always is telling us, go forward. Quit looking back. Go forward. And when you go forward, my protection and my provision and my strength and everything that you need will be there. But you got to go forward. Amen. Oh, I'm starting to get excited. It's easy to take the child out of Egypt, but it takes effort and process to get Egypt out of the child. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we have been delivered, but we have not been yet liberated. We need to be retaught. We still got Egypt and Pharaoh in our head, folks, and in our carnal desires. Romans 12, 1 through 2. This is so, we, we say this all the time, but we forget the first part. This is Paul talking. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, I beseech you. This is Paul talking to Christians. And he's saying, I beseech you. And do you know what beseech means? He's up there. And this isn't, I beseech you, 
brethren. That you would just, you know, no, 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 no. He's like, I beseech you. It's a begging. It's an imploring. It's intense. He's saying, I beseech you. I beseech each one of you. I, I beg you for crying out loud because this is serious business. Because this is about your call. This is about your destiny. This is about the plan that God has for your life. Are you going to heaven? Yes. Does God love you? Yes. But are you on the path to fulfill the amazing call and destiny that God has for your life? And he said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies, your flesh, as a living sacrifice. That means, folks, as we're walking through the wilderness to get to the promised land, it's our reasonable service to lay down our stinking thinking and our fleshly ways of the past. If I used to sleep around, God says, don't do it anymore. It's not good for you. If I used to lie, don't do it anymore. It's not good for you. It's not revealing my character in you. You know, are you living with somebody that's not your wife? That's not God. He's saying, don't do it anymore. Hello, do you want the blessings and the promises or do you just want some fake, some counterfeit? The church is settling too much for the counterfeit and you will not fulfill the destiny and the call on your life. Does God love you? Yeah. Am I going to heaven? Yeah. But you won't fulfill the call and the plan and the destiny in your life. We've made it too much about God's love and God's heaven or hell. And it is about God's love and it is about heaven or hell. But it's about more than that. We are here to glorify God and to bring his kingdom to earth. And we can't do that if we won't even let the kingdom work in our own life. Oh. First Peter, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust or the former ways. See, the children of Israel, when things would get rough, it was great. Yeah. Oh, Lord, glory to God. It's great. When we're coming out of Egypt, it's great when we saw the plagues on, on the children of, of Egypt, but not on us. Yeah, that's great. Oh, yeah, by the way, we left Egypt. We left Egypt with a bunch of spoil, with silver and gold. Yeah, it's great when the blessings of the Lord are happening to us, right? It's great when all that's happening. And, and we praise and we worship God. And yeah, God's so good when the blessings are pouring out. And for some reason, he does that when we're baby Christians. And I think it's because he wants us to taste the goodness of God. But then we take the goodness of God, and that's all we want. And we get deceived. And we keep walking in, the, in our old ways and professing God. And, you know, and then all we want are the blessings. But the blessings are, are not necessarily going to fall off a tree. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, the former ways that we lived in the world, just like the children of Israel. God had to take them to the wilderness to reteach them his ways because they were infused with the ways of Egypt. Infused. We have been infused with the way of Egypt, with the way of the world. We can't help ourselves. So we have to what? Renew our minds, just like Paul said here. And it's intense. This renewing of the mind is intense. And it's not just anything. It's renewing our minds to the word of God, to his truth. Jesus said, your word is truth. And it's his word that will sanctify you, that will purify you. That, that word that's working in your life. So as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former, you are children of God by, by position, that never changes. No matter what you do, you're a child of God. But are you an obedient child of God? You were once ignorant, but you're not ignorant anymore. You know you will be accountable for every word of God that you've heard in your life. And then it goes on to say, but he who called you, but he who is holy, but he as, wait, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. This is talking about liberation, folks. Do you want to be liberated? Yeah. Liberation of your soul. And it's preparation for the promise. 
Preparation for the promised land, preparation for the call on your life. If you can't pass go here, you're not going to be able to pass go here because you will not a, be able to get here until you deal with the th issues that you need to deal with here. And what I see too many times is people are wanting to be here when they can't even get past here. Yeah. Am I making any sense? So we forfeit God's blessings and plan for temporary gratification. That's what the children of Israel did. We forfeit God's blessings and plan for temporary gratification. So I'm going to jump to 16. I'm going to start at 2. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained again against Moses and Aaron. And how many of you know, it goes on later to say, Moses and Aaron, why are you complaining against us? It wasn't us that they were complaining against. They were complaining against God. So I'm going to say the complaint against God. Oh, it's not my mic? Okay. Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat at the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full for we have for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly again yeah yeah to kill your flesh to kill your old ways of thinking to get egypt out of you yeah i'm taking you through the wilderness god said I mean, he didn't say yes. And they were actually talking about, you know, their bellies and their flesh. And let me just say, you know, they were whining. How many of you know the children of Israel whined when they were in Egypt? How many of you whined when you were in the world? Oh, God, take this from me. Oh, God, when are you going to deliver me? Oh, God, oh, God. And then finally we came to our senses and we received Jesus. Hallelujah. Life is good, right? Life is good. We're going on. And then, and then things get started being a little tough. Then we have to, you know, we're faced with ourselves. We're faced with our flesh. And we don't, we start thinking about how good it was out in the world. And we say, oh, I used to be able to sleep with anybody I wanted to. I used to be able to do whatever I wanted to. I used to be able to have fun anytime and do whatever I wanted to. Have you ever been there? Okay, well, that's kind of what they were doing. Because flesh pot here, the pots of meat represents the flesh. The flesh pots. Oh, I'm sorry if I'm stepping on toes. <laughs> when we sat and we could fulfill whatever the desires of your flesh were. You know, that's the thing in Egypt. You could do whatever you wanted to in Egypt, but you were in bondage. You had a taskmaster. And you weren't happy. But let me just say, you can't take the so-called good things that aren't good things from Egypt into the promised land. Those are the things that have to die. Yeah, I got to die to my flesh. To, in today's society, the way you get over one relationship is you jump in bed with another relationship. I remember those days. Yeah, okay, I wasn't born behind the pulpit, thank you very much. <laughs> I didn't come to Christianity married. I know what it's like to have boyfriends and girlfriends. I know what it's like to be out in the world, okay? And I know what it's like to come to salvation and be confronted with the things of my flesh. And there's a decision time, folks. Am I going to do it God's way? Or am I going to fulfill the lusts of my flesh that feed my poor identity? And I'm going to settle for this poor identity and give myself away because I don't respect myself enough or I don't love myself enough and I need somebody else's approval, whether it be sexual or verbal or otherwise, instead of going forward like God wants me to and press into him and get my identity through him and allow him to purify me, which then brings glory to him. And too many times we get stuck. And that's exactly where the enemy wants you to be because he doesn't want you to go forward. He doesn't care if you go back, but he certainly does not want you to go forward. 
because he does not want God to get any glory. And if anything, he wants God to get the blame because nothing's going right in your life. But if you would just straighten and get in line with the word of God. Yeah, I'm a blessed woman today and I have a wonderful husband. But let me tell you, it wasn't easy. I had doctors after me. I had lawyers after me. I had at least three doctors after me when, when I came to the Lord because I worked at the hospital and I was a cute little thing, okay? And Thank you. And you know, the hospital is a flesh pit. People sleeping with people and you know, and that's the way of the world because that's the way it just is. And then, you know, I... You know, I had to tell people no, and then David and I started becoming friends, and, and, and you know, we did it very, we were in line with the word. We were, I was not going to make, I came out of that pit, I came out of that flesh pot, and I did, I love the Lord so much, because here's the difference. It's one thing to come to God, but it's a whole other thing to come under God. I had decided not only am I coming to Christ, but I am coming under Christ. And I am going to do whatever I have to do, even if I have to die to myself, die to my ego, die to my pride, and I am going to do it God's way. And I had people make fun of me. Well, has he kissed you yet? And I'm like, no. Well, he's not your boyfriend if he hasn't kissed. Bobby, have you slept with him yet? Well, no, I haven't slept with him. And by the way, is that any of you? Bobby, come on. You've got to test drive these things. You got to make sure it works. I mean, come on. And I, that's the world. That's what you're coming out of. And those are the things we need to die to. And I had to tell them, I was so made fun of. I was so talked about. I know what it's like, folks. But let me tell you, I would have not have the blessed marriage that I have today, or at least the self-respect I have for myself. We forfeit God's blessing and plan for temporary gratification, whatever that fleshly gratification may be. Hebrews 12, 12 6 through 16, Therefore strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. This is a warning and an encouragement, folks. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless or profane. Another word for godless is profane. I think the New King James actually used profane. Like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights, his birthright as the oldest son, Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Are you willing to forfeit your birthright? Your birthright is that call that God has on your life. Your birthright are the blessings of God that he just wants to shower and pour out on you. But are you forfeiting that for your fleshly desires like Esau? This is something we should learn from Esau. He forfeited it. Yeah, the blessings of God are for us, but we can forfeit them. Does he love you? Yes, he loves you. Am I going to heaven? Yeah, you're going to heaven. But you just might be forfeiting the call and the plan that God has for you. And that will make you someday die as an unfulfilled individual. Because we are never completely fulfilled. But the lie says... The lie says you're going to be fulfilled by getting this pleasure right now. That's what the lie is. Your past has bled into your present and polluted your future. When you let that happen, your past, Egypt, has bled into your present and polluted your future. So why do we do it? Why? 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 Why do we do it? It's one thing to get saved. 
and believe that we're saved and to believe in Jesus. It's another thing to believe the word of God is true and that it applies to me. So unbelief and fear, unbelief and fear lead to disobedience. That's why we do it. Because we're so accustomed to the old ways and we know how the old ways work that when things get scary, when things get hard, when things get lonely, when things, when we don't understand things, it's so easy to go back than it is to go forward. Because we do not believe God and we do not trust God to have our best interest at heart. Therefore, we turn to disobedience. I love you guys. And I love you too much. Thank you. To let you live in disobedience. So, Exodus 16, what happened? You know, okay, they're whining about their flesh pots, about their bellies and this and that, and God says, fine. Okay, here, poo, manna. And here's the manna, and this is, this is the rules for the manna. You, you gather six days, you don't gather any more than what you and your family can eat, and do not keep any extra. And so some of them did what he said, and some of them kept it until morning. And then it would turn, it, well, let's just read it, because it's really good. In 19... 20, notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, which again, they did not heed the voice of the Lord. But some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. Your disobedience, because of a lack of trust and faith in God, because of your fear, your disobedience is wormy and stinky. Whatever it is. And we all can say, you know what? Hey, I'm not perfect up here. I disobey sometimes, and it's wormy and stinky. And I, and I have to repent. God forgive me, and he's so faithful and just, and God is so faithful throughout this whole story. It's, it's just crazy. And it is because of his faithfulness that he wants us to work out our flesh and to become obedient people. And so just that next thing that, that you're tempted with, the empty enemy will tempt you with, you know, maybe it's sleeping with somebody, maybe it's lying, maybe it's stealing, maybe it's uh, gossip, maybe it's uh, judgment, maybe it's, you know, whatever. Whenever you're tempted with that thing, just remember, it's going to be wormy and stinky in the morning. Wormy and stinky. That person that's not your own sleeping next to you, wormy and stinky. <laughs> We don't see it that way, but in the spirit, it's that way. In 32, in, in 32, this is where we jump way ahead. And in 32 is where they made the golden calf. Because again, they were in fear and unbelief. They didn't believe. They, they had fear. They didn't trust God or, or Moses. You know, they were like freaking out. And how many of us have freaked out? Because, you know, it's not looking the way we thought. It doesn't feel the way we think it should. So we, you know, whatever. And we make our own. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. We make our own calf. We make our own God. Whatever that God may be might be a relationship. It might, it might, <laughs> some of you might mold your own little statues and say, ooh, you know. But whatever you bow your knee to that is not godly then becomes your God and you are in idolatry. And when we think we can make up our own way and rules, when we think we can serve God the way we want to, we're in disobedience. And there's a lot of that going on in the church. There's a lot of, I'm going to do what I want to do because this is the way I want to do it. And we disguise it or we are deceived in thinking that, that we're doing it God's way when we're not. 
and that might fly for a little while, but eventually you're going to miss the blessing and the call that God has for your life. Amen? We don't know or we forget or we don't believe the amazing plan and future God has for us. And we don't trust and obey his ways in order to get it. The way to get God's blessings is just to follow the way of the Lord. We haven't, you know, in marriage, we're supposed to leave the husbands. This is primarily talking to the husbands, but we are supposed to, the husbands are supposed to leave and cleave to the wife. And, and if the husband doesn't leave and cleave, in, in other words, if he stays connected, too closely connected to mommy and daddy, then his relationship with his wife is perverted in that it's not what it could or should be in the eyes of the Lord. And again, this is dealing with our flesh. Some of us, some of you have not left your past life whatever that is, the way you're doing things. You have not left your past life, and therefore you have not left, so you can't cleave. You've, you're connected like, like, you know, if David had not l left his parents, you know, we'd be married. You're still married. You're still, again, in relationship, but you're not cleaving because you haven't been leaving. Does that make sense? You have to leave and cleave in order for this relationship to be all that God wants it to be. Am I still loved? Yes. Am I still going to heaven? Yes. But I can miss what God has for me. Belief is a very important thing. What are you believing today? What are we believing? What are you believing today? Are you believing a lie? And, it, and you know, we, we can come to church and we can talk it. We can really talk it up. We can go out in the community and we can really talk it up. We can, we can convince ourselves we believe, but you know where belief really happens is when you go home. The way you live out your life at home is what you're truly believing. It's not what you're saying and doing here at church. It's what you're day, doing and saying at home. That's what you really believe. Grace, grace. You know, here's the thing. If this is stepping on toes, and I know it is because I struggled with this message. I'm like, oh, God, they're not going to like me anymore. And he's like, well, Bobby, I'm about working on your flesh, too. You want them to like you, or are you going to deliver my word? <laughs> so we're all dying today <laughs> we're all getting our toes stepped on today and here's the thing if God did not love you he would not correct you he would just let you go on your merry way and flounder in your flesh and you know but he loves you. And the word of God says he chastens or he corrects those whom he loves. So we should say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. My daddy really does love me. So we got to deal with all the lies. We got to deal with the lie. What are you believing today? Really do an introspection. And you know, I don't want you to pick your navel. Don't go looking for stuff that isn't there. But really take a good look at your life. It's pretty obvious you shall know them by their fruit. What's the fruit of your life? Is it godly? Is it representing Christ? Or is it representing the world? Does God love you? Yes. Are you going to heaven? Yes. Okay, you get my point. We are to glorify God in our life. We are to... to Go for the kingdom of God in our life. And he is faithful and just to forgive us when we mess up. But there's a difference between sin and iniquity. 
Iniquity is that sin, is that thing, and, and maybe it's there because we were abandoned and abused and rejected, so we got to get healed. But iniquity is that thing that we know is wrong. You know it's wrong, and you choose to do it anyway. That is iniquity, and that is just not good. That will, you know, that will prevent you from fulfilling the call in your life and the plan God has. And let me just tell you, time is running out. You guys are not getting any younger. <laughs> Jesus may not come back, but you're not getting any younger. What are we going to do? Hopefully we're going to, you know, deal with it. So those voices, those voices that whisper at us, oh, those voices... You're not good enough. You're going crazy. You need that thing, whatever that thing is. You're a nobody. You got to talk back to those voices. You're a loser. You, you, can't, you can't do this walk of Jesus. You can't do this walk of, of Christianity. Yeah, you got to turn on and say, hey, shut up. You're a liar. Because greater is he that lives in me than he who is of the world. I can walk in grace, and I can walk in power. And you got to talk to those whispers of the enemy. you got to shut him down. you got to call out every liar. Alcoholism is a liar. Sexual immorality is a liar. Independence is a liar. We are to be dependent upon Christ. You got to call out every liar. Hallelujah. Depression is a liar. Suicide is a liar. Spiritual heaviness is a liar. You got to call out every liar. And just say, I'm going forward. I refuse to look back. I refuse to go back. I'm going forward because God is my protector. God is my direction giver, and I will not. We just have to say, I will not. If you want now, hey, disclaimer. If you don't want to fulfill the call of God in your life, if you don't want to fulfill the plan of God in your life, if you don't want to be fulfilled, hey, just keep doing what you're doing. superficial radicalism. I made that up. <laughs> superficial radicalism. We're radical about Jesus on the outside. But on the inside, we are not willing to face what we need to face. We are not willing to completely surrender and come under Jesus. We are not willing to completely come under the word of God. Now let me just say you are accountable for the word that you know, not the word that you don't know. So if you're a baby, baby Christian, God, you know, God knows where you're at. Grace, grace. He, but you know, the point is we're all supposed to be continually learning. We're all supposed to continually growing, you know, okay. And here's the thing, you cannot overcome what you will not confront. You can go to bed with the lies you can go to bed with the old ways, but you will never be delivered from what you will not confront. What you will not confront can keep you from your blessing and your call. We've got to confront. I've had to confront so many things in my life, people, and I'm continuing to have to confront. Just like today, I'm like, Lord, I, I really don't want to give this message. It's kind of in your face. And well, not in God's face, but in your face. And that, you know, I just trust the Lord to de help deliver it the way he wants to. Because the church today, you know, there's the sloppy agape. We, you know, we just think we can serve God the way we want to. And, and that all, all is fair and love and war. And it's not. You know, it's, we do it God's way to inherit the blessings and to inherit the kingdom and to be a real impact on the world. You know, and I just, there's so much more for this house. And there's so much more for the, you know the kingdom at large and you are a vital part of the kingdom do not let anybody tell you otherwise and if you don't think so you're believing the lie 
You're believing the lie that you have to do it this way. You're believing the lie that, that you know, of your flesh, if nothing else. You know your flesh will lie. So in the end, God loves you, and you're going to heaven. But are you going to fulfill the call and the plan? I know God's given you guys some dreams. And some of you, maybe those dreams should have been fulfilled a long time ago, but you keep going around the same mountain because you haven't been willing to confront that thing in your life and really be set free from it. It's become a friend, not a good friend, but a friend. And God will not deliver you from your friends. You gotta walk away from your friends. You gotta confront your friends. You gotta apply the blood to your friends. You gotta apply the word of God to those things in your life. And you have got to walk it out. And that's the wilderness. But once you do, and I'm a testimony to that, and I'm gonna continue going forward, once you do, God calls you up even higher. Because if I can't deal with this wilderness, whenever I get to the promised land, you know the promised land has its giants of its own, has its enemies of its own that I'm going to need to fight, that I'm going to need to overcome. I am an overcomer, but it's my job to fight them. It's my job to take them on. And God said I could, but I can't. If I can't even get through the wilderness, how much can I? I can't even get to the promised land. Much I can't even deal with those things that are in the promised land. So we are either going to be a past dweller or a destiny achiever. Ask yourself, do I want to be a past dweller? Or do I want to be a destiny achiever? And I think we could all take a good look at our life a good look and say, what is it that I'm not dealing with? What is it that needs to die? And it's scary. I was, I was scared to get up here today. <laughs> Y'all don't think that. But I was scared to get up here today and give this word. It might be scary to walk away from something of the world that you're used to, that security blanket. And too many times, you know, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna talk straight to you. There's relationships, immoral relationships in the house. And that they shouldn't be. Christianity should be different than the world. And what we try to do, what people try to do, they try to bring the world into the church and act like everything's okay. Now, no condemnation, but we do believe in conviction. And too many times those relationships are our security blanket. It's not that we should even be in that relationship, and that relationship is preventing us from the depth that we need to go in Christ. Because we turn to that individual, we turn to that relationship, we turn to that warm body, we turn to that whatever, instead of pressing into Christ and going deeper. And in the process, we're defiling ourselves and we're defiling others. That's one issue. And then there's others. But God is calling this house up. He's calling you up. And in order to go up, you gotta let some things go. You gotta loosen the luggage, <laughs> the baggage that you've brought in from the world. Again, he loves you, you go into heaven. But how bad do you want to pursue the call and the plan? And it's not just about the call and the plan because really that's secondary, it's about Jesus. It's about that relationship. And I've said before and I said again, to be friends with the world is an enmity with God. Adulterers and adulteresses, you know, we, we, we play house. Let's quit playing house and let's get serious. And let's do this thing God has called us to do. Like I said, I see so much potential in you guys. It's not even, it's crazy. I see it because I don't deal with your uh, issues. 
You know what I'm saying? You guys got things that are blinding your eyes, blinding your heart, hardening your heart to the truth of God, and you're living that out. I don't live there with you, so I can see the potential, and it grieves me. It grieves me. And it grieves God because he's got so much better for you. So, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you've stepped on our toes today. Thank you, Lord, because you got so much more for all of us. I thank you, God, that you love me so much that you would have me do this message, that, and you love them so much. You don't want us to stay where we're at. Lord, I pray that this word was delivered with your grace and love. And if not, I pray that you would shower them with grace and love now. In Jesus' name. And Lord, we do love you. And I truly believe each and every person in this house wants to fulfill your call. So Lord, help us. Help us, Holy Spirit. Help us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.